because what comes after Bible translation? You have church planting and church strengthening. You have study Bibles and study notes and commentaries and Christian literature and catechisms and confessions and creeds. The church begin, begins theologizing from Scripture if Scripture is its authority and it's a healthy Orthodox church. And so biblical counseling books need to be written and hermeneutics books and systematic theologies in that language, which are tied to a good translation. So yes, for the long-term health of the church in each language group, we really need to be equipping local pastors and ministers and Christian leaders and all interested people in, in the knowledge of the biblical languages. Welcome to It Means What It Means, the podcast in which a guy with some college and a day job has long-form conversations about biblical texts. Today's guest is Kyle from Bible Translation Fellowship. This is episode four in my Islam in the Bible series. His chapter was about how local churches should take more control and take more responsibility. I will own up to the fact that I drive the conversation into examining people on the ground learning biblical languages. And that may be something that you will think, no, I don't like that. Why did you do that? And you probably have more to say. I feel it was a very important question to ask because why rely on translations? I think is how I'm approaching this. Translations do seem like an important part of transmitting biblical texts, but if your focus is on how churches worship together, I don't know that education shouldn't be the way to approach that. So that is ultimately something that I wanted to camp out a bit on, and and I don't feel like he pushed back that much, so I feel like it was a pretty productive conversation as far as that goes. Without any further ado, Here's my conversation with Kyle from Bible Translation Fellowship. Kyle from Bible Translation Fellowship, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, good to be here. So before we get going, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? I was born and raised in Southern California and came to faith in Christ uh, when I heard the gospel. Uh, In my early teens, my family had relocated to North Carolina, so I spent some years on the East Coast. And then back to California, did some studies in philosophy, organizational leadership, traveled after college for about seven months in almost 30 countries, and was really just trying to figure out what kind of missionary work the Lord might direct me into. I was really interested in proclaiming Christ where he was not known and just seeking the Lord's will in that. And I started along the way, just learning about the need for Bible translation, ended up back in school, which wasn't my favorite thing to do or my first idea, but Bible translation requires lots of training. So back to school, learning Greek, learning Hebrew, learning theology, hermeneutics, linguistics, translation studies, all those things. And uh, desired as a young man to go into missions, but the Lord delayed that until I was uh, in my 40s. So just only a couple years ago, my wife and I moved to South Africa, and we're based uh, near Cape Town, where I now am serving in various roles in Bible translation, working towards becoming a translation consultant, which we can talk a little bit about that. And also leading a ministry called Bible Translation Fellowship, where I do mentoring and recruiting and advising other people, trying to advocate for more churches to be involved in Bible translation. Yeah, that's in a nutshell, 45 plus years. I know that this is not actually the central uh, point of what you were saying about yourself, but what I bumped on there is 30 countries in seven months. Is that what you said? That did happen. Okay, were these contiguous countries? What was the, and you, I mean, you don't have to go in the specific countries if you don't want to, you don't feel comfortable doing that, but what are the logistics of that in a nutshell? The first two years out of college, I was researching and planning that trip and just different contacts through different churches. So most every country in Central and South America was by bus. And then flew to um, Europe and really just kind of made a hightail to Austria, 
spent some time there in Hungary. And then down to Africa, where I spent some time in Uganda and Kenya and what is now South, this is 20 years ago, but what is now South Sudan. So most, yeah, the bulk of the countries were in Central and South America and then Eastern Europe. And, Which is topographically, that's still quite an endeavor in South and Central America. Yeah, yeah. The goal was really, I at the time was just visiting missionaries and learning about all the different kinds of mission work. What do missionaries do? What are their needs? I actually took a little video camera with me. Uh, this was back when mini DV tapes had just come out. And so I just had this little camcorder and I would interview missionaries. And the thought at the time was to just you know, I had a set number of questions. Why are you here? Why did you come? What are the needs? All those kinds of things. And I thought I would eventually put a website together where I would help other people thinking about missions to think about all the different kinds of roles and responsibilities and opportunities on the mission field. It never came together in terms of putting all that content out, but the Lord definitely used it in my own life. Yeah, that's a crazy amount of work, no matter what the outcome is. Okay, I won't. Okay, I won't belabor the we point. We can do another on one on that one. <laughs> What's that? We can do another podcast on that one. Oh yeah, not not even another episode. That could be another podcast on the logistics yeah. of the, your travel in your earlier days. And no, and so we talked about this before. I'm not releasing the video, but I will say, if you guys saw him, you would not think he was 45 plus years into life. Um, he looks like a handsome young man and he's older than me. Uh, okay. But I'm not going to belabor the point on logistics. That would be interesting, but that's not why you're here. Why you're here is your chapter in Islam in the Bible, which as the listeners are hearing this, they will have heard several other interviews in a row. And this will be, I think the fourth one. So your chapter is Bible translation by and for the church. And where my thinking got started was appropriately with your, what I took to be your thesis that the Bible is ecclesiologic, ecclesiological in its essence, and that it is to be translated for the church. Honestly, as far as this point getting fleshed out, I'm fine if we don't make a whole lot more progress than just getting an understanding of what you mean by that. I, th I think we will be able to touch on some other branches from there. So can you walk us through that, what you mean by that? Yeah, definitely. This is a topic that has been of interest to me for years, and it only just was published recently in this uh, recent work. It's also the topic that I'm writing my dissertation for my PhD on, so it's an area that I'm really interested in. And we can talk about aspects of history and, and, and all those things, but Starting at least with Eugene Nida, I can at least say that starting with Eugene Nida, which many people will know him as a pioneer in Bible translation related to a theory of translation, like that's called dynamic equivalence or functional equivalence or idiomatic translations or things like that. But at least starting with Nida, I noticed that the Bible came to be conceived of as this thing that we give to non-Christians and that almost as if it's this evangelistic tract that it needs to be, and the Bible translation movement will, will give these four qualities. The translation needs to be clear and accurate and natural and acceptable. So if we take the accuracy out of there, that's related to how does it relate to the source text that's being translated. Is the translator starting from Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic? Usually not. So the source text is usually a translation that the translator is already familiar with, like English or French or some other language. So accuracy has to do with the source text. So the other qualities of a translation, clear, natural, and acceptable, are all interconnected to the idea of who the target audience is for the translation. And Nida, at, you know, in the 60s, writing in the 1960s, said that the unbeliever, the non-Christian, is the appropriate target audience. So what I'm trying to argue for a little bit in this chapter, and much more at length in my dissertation, is to say the Bible as a whole was not written down primarily for the non-Christian. 
It's not to say there's no messages within Scripture that aren't targeted to non-Christians. It's to say the Bible as a whole was written down primarily addressed to Christians, to believers, to, we might say, God's covenant community, if we don't want to be anachronistic and say Christians and not speak to the old covenant community. So the covenant community, the covenant people of God, that's the audience to whom Scripture was primarily addressing. This becomes really clear when you look at Paul's letters. He's writing them to churches. Um, but even if you just expand and back up into the entire of Scripture, Meredith Klein has a book that's really clear on this about the, the structure of biblical authority, that Scripture is a covenant document for a covenant people. And so I'm just trying to raise the flag and say, I think we need to rethink our Bible translation theory or our philosophy of translation and evaluate the audience that Scripture addresses and then let that speak to the audience for whom we translate Scripture or primarily translate Scripture. And then, of course, there's all sorts of nuances and additions. We can talk about paratextual material, which is footnotes and glossaries and introductions to books. We can talk about resources outside of Scripture, whether it be evangelistic literature or things that help believers understand and interpret Scripture. Resources for pastors like study Bibles. Who should the footnotes be addressing? All of those things. But basically, I'm just trying to argue that Scripture, when we consider the audience for whom it was primarily addressing, is the covenant people of God. So it's a covenant book. It's even called in Exodus 24 and throughout the Old Testament a covenant book, and it's for a covenant community. So I'm saying that has implications for Bible translation. From that point of view, I don't know, there's a philosophical thing about translation then. So I know I said I wouldn't use my questions as a checklist, and I am committed to that. But, you know, I'm seeing out of the corner of my eye the second question, which is about knowledge of original languages. So being able to engage biblical texts in the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek of their original authorship. And I just wonder, so... I could kind of understand the philosophy behind the idea that you would translate for people outside of whatever body you are trying to communicate with. So if you're Jewish, the expectation of someone who's not Jewish knowing Hebrew or Aramaic, it's probably not going to be very good odds if you want to engage with a, a non-Jewish audience. Or if you're Christian, the Hebrew Bible and New Testament being in their original languages is not going to be very, it's not going to bring about a lot of enthusiastic engagement with people outside of your community. Why isn't there more of an effort within churches for people to be able to engage biblical texts in the original languages? Because it really does seem like using a vernacular translation allows access for outsiders, but insiders being able to engage with the would be more productive. You're bringing up some really good questions. So let me first address the idea of other faiths like Judaism, Islam. It's interesting that Protestant evangelicals in the 1900s began to conceptualize Bible translation primarily as this evangelistic work. When you look at Islam, from the little bit that I've read by scholars in this area, there's huge debates about whether the Quran can even be translated, and whether you should consider the Quran legitimate if you're reading it in a translation. People learning Arabic for their prayers. When you look at Jewish Bible translation, the history of the Old Testament translated for Judaism, for Jewish people, everything that I've read in that area points to a completely different view of the holy text, not as untranslatable, but that as identifying the audience as the believing covenant community. So if you're looking at the Jewish people who in modern day time only know German or Yiddish or whatever language it is where that covenant community is now living, you read authors like Leonard Greenspoon and Robert Alter and all sorts of other people that are writing about Bible translation and its history among the Jewish people. 
do not share the same con- conception that 1900 evangelicals who are treating scripture as an evangelistic tract would view. So I just want to make that brief comment to say rare and unique for evangelicals to start doing that in the 1900s. And John Barton has made this same point in his recent book, The Word. Uh, That's the UK title. And he goes back and looks at NIDA and says, yes, you can see this movement among evangelicals who think about the evangelistic task of the Protestant church and want to reach the nations with this message and then truncate that message and say, we got to get the gospel to these unreached unengaged people groups. Therefore, we need to translate scripture. So scripture now becomes synonymous with the gospel. Bringing the gospel to unreached, unengaged peoples becomes the work of translating scripture for those unreached, unengaged peoples. So I want to, I just want to footnote that as I'm on my way to answering your question about the biblical languages. For far too long, in recent history at least, there's been this trend of not teaching local pastors and Christian leaders the biblical languages. I remember um, a couple years ago, I was speaking to a man who's a translation consultant in India, working with many languages that are translating scripture, not from Greek and Hebrew, but from Hindi or English or some other translation. And when I asked if he was also training the mother tongue translators in the biblical languages, he said, no, it takes too long. So that's one reason I can give you for why many in the translation community say, no, we're not training indigenous local Christian pastors and leaders in the biblical languages. They'll say it just takes too long. I don't want to go off on that tangent unless you want to. I disagree with some of the pragmatism and even the evaluation of the time that it takes to train someone in the biblical languages and whether that's faster once you consider that a translation is coming from a translation and then has to be back translated so that a translation consultant can check the back translation against the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic I'm not sure that we're really talking about the same amount of time. I want to say very charitably that I understand why NIDA and others in the 1900s were advocating for faster. We want to reach people with the gospel, with the message that's in the Bible. Um, But there are some great resources online now for teaching Hebrew. Olive with Beth is free, YouTube channel, teaching biblical Hebrew, not through any other language medium, but just biblical Hebrew through biblical Hebrew. And Alpha with Angela is doing the same with Koine Greek. So there are resources now through technology that are making biblical language training more available and free, of course, if people have phones and internet access. But yes, I think if we go back and look at, for example, the Protestant Reformation, The goal was not, oh my gosh, we need more scripture produced. The end goal was not translations of scripture seen as a product. The goal was healthy churches. And there was a vacuum of leadership in these churches during the Reformation. And so the immediate goal became, we need to train up more ministers of the word. So they began training ministers in Calvin's Geneva and Luther's Wittenberg and all over the place during the Reformations. And what were they training them in? The biblical languages and exegesis and hermeneutics and theology. And then these men went back and served in churches. And of course, they were going all over the globe where God's word was not yet translated into the languages that the people knew best. So these pastors who were theologians also became translators. The end goal was healthy churches in which God's word was translated in the language that people knew, not just scripture products to hand out to to people that could be immediately clear and natural and acceptable to the non-Christian. Yeah, I definitely want to post that flag in the ground and say, yes, we need to be emphasizing the teaching of the biblical languages not just for a better 
translation of scripture, but also for the long-term health of the church and churches in that language group. Because what comes after Bible translation? You have church planting and church strengthening. You have study Bibles and study notes and commentaries and Christian literature and catechisms and confessions and creeds. The church begin, begins theologizing from Scripture, if Scripture is its authority and it's a healthy Orthodox church. And so biblical counseling books need to be written and hermeneutics books and systematic theologies in that language, which are tied to a good translation. So yes, for the long-term health of the church in each language group, we really need to be equipping local uh, pastors and ministers and Christian leaders and all interested people in the knowledge of the biblical languages. And that's where a lot of your, you did a pretty good job of building a transition in there for me. A lot of what you're suggesting is lower level, local pastor translator type things. Is that a fair description of what you're proposing? Yes, exactly. And I'm borrowing from the conversations that have been going on for a long time out of the Reformation where pastors need to be generalists. And so this idea of theologians only being in the academy and pastors only being in the church, whereas these two things need to be brought together. In recent years, numerous late popular level books have captured that phrase, pastor theologian, and things like that. And so I'm just borrowing that language and looking back at the Reformation and saying, Yes, the, the crisis and the end goal is healthy churches that display God's character and proclaim his message. And healthy churches, therefore, need scripture in the language that they know best. And those churches, according to my understanding of scripture, have to be ordered with biblically legitimate leadership. And so that leadership should be knowledgeable and equipped in how to interpret God's word, which can happen with them just reading a translation, but can happen better and more healthy for the long-term health of that church in that language group when those leaders and pastors and other lay people know the biblical languages and can sort through, why did this translation do it this way? Or how can we do this better in our languages? Many missionary translators who went out in the 1900s and 1800s, man, depending on where they were sent from, they either did or did not know the biblical languages. Depending on their own background and training, they may or may not have known the biblical languages. And so then they're learning the target language of the people they're trying to translate. They're working with mother tongue translators, or at that time, they would have been called translation advisors or language helpers. But they're trying to learn the target or receptor language And they're making mistakes, and if they're reading from a translation, they're dependent on that translation. So it's happened, you know, when we look at the number of languages in the world, somewhere around 7,400, and only less than 10% of those languages, around 740 or 750 languages of the world, even have a full translation of God's work. The work is still a lot to be done. And many of those translations that have been done are already so old that they need to be redone or revised. Well, who's going to revise them? If you have not, as a missionary coming into a new culture and a new language, if you've not equipped local Christians in everything they need to do, Bible translation and planting churches and strengthening churches and theological education, then how are they going to revise the translation when it needs to be done? Or what's happened since the advent of the kind of dynamic, functional idea of Bible translation. A church is given a translation from a missionary, and then over time that church decides they want a different translation, or they reject the translation altogether. So, yeah, we're talking about a number of aspects where the end goal is not just this scripture product. The end goal is a healthy church with people who know the biblical languages, can interpret them, and minister the Word of God, both evangelistically in their, to the next tribe and language over, but also among the people that are believers in that community. So I, the issue f- from me to, to the guest on, I think, probably all of these episodes for Islam and the Bible— uh, why not learn original languages? It has come up, and 
I should probably address this to the listeners. Show. Look, I'm not saying that if you're a Jew who doesn't know Hebrew and Aramaic, you're less than other Jews who do. Or if you're a Christian, you don't know Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and that, that you're less than a Christian. I don't have a dog in that fight. I think from, and this will make sense, I hope, when I'm done. Um, uh, from the point of view, though, of this being a significant collection of texts, ancient texts, I think if somebody were to pick up the Epic of Gilgamesh and really like it and have a translation on their shelf at home and they pick it up and they read it once a year, we would say that person is a Gilgamesh enthusiast, but we certainly wouldn't call them an expert. And I understand expert expertise may not be the aim of every believer or practitioner in Judaism, whatever you want to call it. Everyone engaged in a faith or a community of belief may not want to be an expert, but I think it would be demonstrative of the significance. And I'm thinking of a conversation that I had with someone I know, and we were talking about just the subject. And he, they said, yeah, I don't really need to know the original languages. I can do word studies. I have concordances and things like that. And it just reminded me of the kind of frustrating Rube Goldberg device of interpretation that I was trying to put together as a teenager. And, and that made me think, okay, so you do kind of emphasize hermeneutical ability and exegetical ability in addition to theology. And I'm realizing that's not something, hermeneutics and exegesis are something that have not been discussed in depth too much on this podcast. Do you mind taking a moment breaking down what you mean when you're talking about exegesis and hermeneutics and theology, if you don't mind? Sure. At least since the Enlightenment, I think some Protestants and maybe just generally speaking evangelicals have looked at the interpretation of Scripture as a science that is something like other sciences out there in the academic world. I think some of that impulse was apologetic. They wanted to say, no, no, we're using the same rules of interpreting any text. You look at the history and the grammar and you make interpretation. And therefore, we're not doing anything different in our historical grammatical rules of interpretation with scripture. And look, there's all different kinds of genres in scripture. And so we apply the same kind of rules of interpretation. But that's not how Protestants have always thought about Bible translation. And even before the Reformation, that's certainly not how Christians have conceived of exegesis, hermeneutics, and interpretation. These, these phrases get bubbled together, hermeneutics, exegesis, interpretation. They're essentially all talking about the same kind of ideas, although properly speaking, when you're thinking of hermeneutics as a discipline, you're talking more about the philosophy of language and principles that then drive your actual work of interpretation, or what we would say is exegesis, drawing the meaning out of the language. Um, there's been whole journals in the Bible translate dedicated to this topic of how interpretation relates to translation. There's certain statements that are accepted in the Bible translation community and world that say we should not allow our theological bias. So they use very negative words. Um, uh, when theology and translation and interpretation all come into the same picture or conversation, theology as, is treated like this unwelcome guest. But backing up for a second, all translators will agree, if they're in the right mind, and are, have gone down in print, good translators will say, yes, the first step in Bible translation is to interpret the source text. Whatever that source may be, it might not be the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. It may be your English or French. But whatever your source is, you, your first step in translation is to interpret the meaning and then to render that in the target language. So then backing up one step and saying, what's involved in interpretation? And in the field of biblical studies and hermeneutics, it's long been understood that this is a sort of, you might call, reciprocal or circular relationship. 
when I read, uh, Vern Poitras makes this point, when I read In the Beginning God, if I've not read any other part of Scripture, and I've only read those few words, Genesis 1, then my conceptions about God are forming my interpretation of this text. But now if I keep reading Scripture and I get all the way to Psalm 23 and I understand the book of Psalms, now I have a lot more information about this God as my shepherd, for example, in this metaphor, which then when I go back and reread the Bible for the second time, I have a whole different, if I'm trusting and believing what the Bible says to be true about all its statements about who God is, then when I read the Bible a second time, my theology that I've now gathered from all the different parts of Scripture saying all these different things about God and who He is and what He's like, those should that should inform my interpretation. So when I reread In the Beginning God, coming to mind should be my biblical and systematic and historic exegetical theology should be working. In fact, it is working, whether it's conscious and I'm acknowledging it, or it's just functional, that we all are born in space and time. We all have gifts and abilities and culture and language and worldviews and world vision and all these different ideas. And we're coming to a text like scripture and hearing or reading and we're interpreting it out of that environment. And there's a whole discipline now or, or field of biblical studies called the theological interpretation of Scripture, which in old language would just be the recognition of what we call biblical theology, that Scripture is progressive in its nature and that it's continuing to expand and grow. And therefore, later parts of Scripture help reveal earlier parts of Scripture and clearer parts of Scripture help reveal less clear parts of Scripture. So the question is not whether people have a theology. Everyone is trying to summarize and condense and see what Scripture in one place says about marriage and how that fits in harmony with what Scripture says in another place about marriage or whatever the topic is. And all I'm trying to say is that the functional theology, the people's theology, people's systematizing of Scripture is in place when they read or hear and interpret Scripture and then translate Scripture. And slowly but surely, people are writing about this and noting it. Another dissertation just came out of the UK about theology's place and influence in translation. And the author was analyzing, I think, the Chinese Union version of the Bible in China and how theology played an importance in that. And I think that one of the author's points in that dissertation was, let's not hide and pretend like we don't have theological convictions. Let's put them out there and state what they are, and then be open to realizing that maybe we interpreted and over-translated in such a way that we're not leaving certain ambiguities that are there in the original, because we're trying to make sure people arrive at our theological conclu conclusion or something like that. But let me summarize all that to say, at least in the Bible translation community, there has been an unhealthy and negative view towards theology and hermeneutics. And let's just give people the bare text. Let's just translate the meaning, extract the meaning from the form. And that's what we give people is just scripture. But that is a naive and impossible task when we consider that theology is at play during interpretation. And interpretation is what's happening when we translate. Yeah, there isn't really such a thing as just the text. It's just not possible. I think to use your example of in the beginning God, I find it hard to believe that anyone in contemporary American society who's grown up their whole life here is not going to have a certain understanding of what God means when they get to that word. Do you think that's fair to say? Yeah, whatever conceptions and environment and all those things, exactly. So further reading may enhance or disabuse them of whatever that initial conception was. But even if, actually, this is a pretty popular thing, is the, I don't believe in a God that's an old man sitting in the clouds in the sky. It's like that thing that you're negating, you're like, I don't believe this. I think it's still probably there when you're reading a text about a divine actor. It, the, your negation is your rejection of that is still there when you're reading going forward. 
Yeah, I think Romans 1 would make that point that people try to suppress the truth of who God is, but in our conscience and in the natural created world, God has given evidence of himself. And you can say you deny it, but you functionally live according to the reality. Some of this is shared in just the general field of hermeneutics across literary studies. Rosaria Butterfield was converted to Christianity in part because she gave the Bible a fair reading and she was coming from a field of English literature. And she felt that, okay, if I'm at least going to give the Bible a fair reading, or really what she wanted to do was just, as she said in her testimony, criticize and critique and disprove and those things. So she read not just a piece here and there, she read the entire Bible to hear what it conceived of uh, about who God is and his claims on humanity and all those things. But look, interpretation is still at play when we're reading the biblical languages. So we can't just say, oh, we need to teach people Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. Yes, I agree. But, you know, as one of my Greek professors used to say, learning Greek is not going to somehow give you this mystical key to the answer of interpreting every single text. If I'm reading an English translation, there might be two or three or seven possible interpretations. And then if I go and read the Greek, I might remove two or three or four of those English interpretations because they're not even possible in the Greek, depending on the translation. But I might introduce two or three more new translate uh, interpretations when I'm reading the Greek, because Greek's a language. So whatever language you're reading in, whether it's a translation of scripture or the original text of scripture, I still have to interpret the language and, and the text. And so my worldview, my theology, all those things are at play in my interpretation. So I understand what you're saying, and I'm only, I am making this point to be illustrative. I am not trying to argue with you. Uh, yep. I think there is a however. Uh, a guy like Douglas Campbell, and I don't know how much you've engaged in his work, but the conversation with my friend Daniel will already be out for the listeners. But my friend Daniel delivered this paper back in 2014, and we discussed it a few weeks ago, where he's looking at the word gar as a transition in dialogues that is it is just not something to the Greek word gar, gamma alpha rho, for the listeners, that word as a transition to show a shift from one speaker to another. That's not something you're going to get. And particularly he and others are talking about it in relation to or in its use in Romans 1 to say that the passage that you just referenced is not Paul, but rather an interlocutor with whom Paul is arguing that Paul is asserting something in Romans, but that he is not asserting this point. And I think someone might say, yeah, but all of that stuff is academic, but it's not. To be able to come to a better understanding of what the rhetorical devices at the disposal of a first century or second temple diaspora Jew who's writing in Koine Greek to people in Asia Minor who think very differently than us. I think it does bolster your point that a lot of these conversations need to be happening at the lowest level, that SBL conferences and journal articles are fine, but for these things to be productive, it, they are happening in communities and wherever possible, these conversations need to be happening in communities. No, it is not a panacea for people to learn Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. It is, however, an additional tool in their toolbox whether it's every single member of a congregation or the pastor, because that's where these texts come from. It, does that make sense or am I just rambling? Yeah, it does. I think there's a few things at play here in terms of Bible translation. Uh, D.A. Carson in his little book, Jesus, the Son of God, critiqued with a broad blanket a lot of translators saying, you guys have great training in linguistics, but you don't even have the equivalent of the kind of training that a pastor would get who has an MDiv, 90 to 100 plus credit hours of theology, which would be the full gamut of biblical exegetical, systematic, historical, and practical theology, biblical languages. I don't think, we don't want to say that every mother tongue translator or every missionary translator 
has to have three PhDs in what I call the Bible translation triad. Exegesis, which would include hermeneutics, interpretation, biblical languages, theology, and then linguistics and translation studies. We cannot expect people to be experts across all these fields to translate scripture. But the translation team as a whole needs people representing these different areas that are required of translating scripture, which requires interpretation of scripture. Yes, it's great if lay people start learning biblical languages, but God has so ordered his church, Ephesians 4, that he also gives gifts of people to the church to do the ministry of teaching and preaching and evangelism and all of these different gifts. And so the ministry of the word, which I would conceive of Bible translation as a ministry of the word, needs to have team members who do have these different abilities and skills, the biblical languages, and not just at the end process through a translation consultant who's checking a back translation, but on the front end, when the translators are interpreting the text, that they're working from the biblical languages. And there's someone who, you know, so many mother tongue translators will be translating from a translated text, but some teams will have a translation advisor or what we call an exegete. And that person will know one or two of the biblical languages and they can inform the team on what the Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic is doing. But not all teams have that. So I think we do have to recognize sort of some of the practical realities in terms of Bible translation requiring many different skills and abilities, but also still situate the work of Bible translation as a ministry that a church or multiple churches working together are doing to plant churches, strengthen churches, and give God's people God's word. You brought up a Greek word. And I just want to say that, yeah, even in that area of somebody arguing for a certain interpretation, they're not only evaluating. I, I should say it would be rare in, in modern scholarship if someone was only evaluating a Greek word and arguing either for that same word or phrase being consistent with how we've interpreted in the past, or if they're arguing something new. It would be odd to me if they were not incorporating different disciplines like linguistics, translation studies, theories of language, um, philosophy of language. So even when somebody comes to reading and evaluating Koine Greek, are they going back and looking at how that Greek was used in the Septuagint, the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek? And then as they're evaluating Septuagintal Greek, are they using different disciplines? Like within linguistics, there's all different kinds of theory. Are you using generative linguistics, functional linguistics, cognitive linguistics? And does that theory of linguistics have a philosophy of language that has any sort of recognition of who God is? Or do you have a, a, a theology of language, a philosophy of language that's also informed by what Scripture says? about language itself and how we as human beings are made in the image of God and use language and in this way reflect God in his use of language. And we're unique creatures in all of God's creation in the way that we image God in our use of language. So people are writing dissertations at master's and PhD degrees, and they're borrowing from linguistics and translation studies, and they're applying this one theory of language or theory of linguistics, which is steeped in decades and years of other scholars who have come to conclusions, but they're doing that and applying it even to the biblical languages and saying, oh, with this theory, I can come out with this interpretation of the Hebrew or of the Greek or of the Aramaic. So I think your example just, um, I don't know if you meant to or want to disagree, but I think it bolsters what at least I'm trying to communicate of how these different fields are related and used together. I actually did mean it. I meant it to bolster the <laughs> point that you were making. But because, okay, at its core, what I intend for this podcast to be is for people to understand that if I reach behind me and I pick up, and I'm doing air quote, the Bible off of the shelf that's behind me, that's one, not the only copy in this house. Uh, it's not the only translation. You're talking about in, a translation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But also that bound volume 
it, particularly the one that's behind me, it's the New English translation. So it has a ton of footnotes, right? So it's actually a really good example. A lot of work from a lot of people went into producing that thing. And I don't just mean the physical volume, but even the digital one you can go on Bible Gateway and get. But whether you're going on Bible Gateway or you're picking something up off the shelf or you're listening to an audiobook. Uh, whether it's a translation or even the original languages. So you mentioned Martin Luther, the critical texts, the critical edition that he had produced by Desiderius Erasmus is literally inferior to the ones that you or I, actually, I have one behind me, that, of the Greek New Testament because of the sources that Erasmus had at his disposal. What I want people to understand is the gravity of engaging with the text, whether you're a believer or not. Whether you're talking about the spiritual significance, the theological significance, the historical significance, the literary significance of these texts. And I do like to think of them as texts. I hope that's not offensive to anyone's sensibilities, but to consider these things seriously, whether you're a believer, whether you're part of a community of belief or engagement or not, it's a heavy task. And in the same way that I'm sure we all know you know, you're from the United States. I'm from, you meet a dude who's like 55 years old and he's really into the Civil War and he's been to Antietam or he's seen the site of the Battle of Petersburg and he can break it down. And that's his hobby. And what I'm saying is, especially for people who see a spiritual and cosmological significance to this, let's take this series. Whether you think the consequences are eternal or, and I don't think this is mere, but for someone who thinks it's cosmological or eternal, you would think merely intellectual. I think any of those concerns, taking the text seriously and engaging with it as seriously as possible, is really important. And to contrast from 16th century Wittenberg, the political context and the economic context of having to train people at the college there at Wittenberg is no longer the case that if you are going into another country to expose people one way or another, and you could be going digitally into another country, this episode may be downloaded in India. So we may, you and I may be involved in a conversation with one another and with someone in India. I think encouraging serious engagement as much as possible and the amount of information we have at our disposal collectively, globally, is so vast. Yes, I, I do agree with you, but maybe for different motivations than you have specifically. Again, I'm sorry. I know I was rambling. No, yeah, I think your point is a good one. Um, and, you know, in Bible translation, you mentioned English translations like the NET. You know, like the ESV, the English Standard Version, which is you know, just an update of the long history of the King James. You've got 50 scholars, who, all with PhDs, some of them multiple PhDs, working on that translation. Then the study note version is like 100 scholars. So the NIV, a lot of these English translations that are well used by English-speaking church around the world, they're committee translation with lots of people on them. But now Bible translation into the minority languages of the world, um, these are just one, two, three, a few handful of people working on the translation. Yes, we do not have the same economic and kind of environment of the Protestant Reformation. We can't just look back on that and say, how do we duplicate it? Um, but there are some lessons there to think about what is the end goal uh, it's not just scripture products, it's healthy churches. And because I, that's what I understand the Great Commission to be about, the task of making disciples in Matthew 28, as understood by the rest of the apostles and writers of the New Testament in the book of Acts and elsewhere, is to say the work of spreading the gospel of who Jesus Christ is, his life and death and resurrection and what that means and the forgiveness of sins and repentance and faith, the, that work that we call evangelism then leads to, if people respond in repentance and faith to the gospel, then we call that discipleship. We're now training or equipping these followers of Christ. What are we equipping them according to or in? Well, it's in Scripture, which has to come through translation. And so that work of planting or strengthening churches is now right up against the work of Bible translation. And so we want to leave in place, uh, if you're a missionary coming into a new language and a new culture, you don't want to just leave products in place, whether they're digital or physical, whether it's scripture or, or 
catechisms, you want to leave people in place that know how to, as you've put it, engage seriously with the very scriptures that God ordained and decreed and commanded that his prophets and apostles and evangelists write down. I just finished a chapter on my dissertation, just basically going through the entirety of scripture and noting all the places that God commands that the special revelation that he gave to his prophets and evangelists and apostles be written down. He did not leave it up to oral memory and human memory. He wanted it down in writing for a public, visible witness, a covenant legal document as a testimony for himself and even against his people. Oftentimes it talks about the book of the covenant is a testimony against your sinfulness and unfaithfulness. Yes, there's so much to be thinking about your point of how to engage seriously with these documents, these texts that God himself commanded to be written. I feel like we fleshed out the core of your argument, but knowing that you are quite a consider you're about a third of a day in the future from me. I don't want to keep you too long. So there were a lot of specific that you did mention. Was there anything in your chapter that you were hoping we would discuss that I left out? And it will be, I left it out listeners. He didn't leave. (laughs) I think we hit a number of the things uh, that you had mentioned and questioned in terms of interpretation, relating the audience We even dipped into the idea that I've bring out in the chapter how Bible translation has become really specialized. It's this field for linguists and translators, um, but we really need to bring it back to uh, what we've already talked about, pastors, lay people, church leaders, people who are ministers of the word. Um, You know, there was a point that I made in the chapter that we really need stable texts. Um, we don't need a translation that's just going to change every two years. Of course, language changes with globalization. There's, When I was growing up, there was no such thing as Google. And then Google was a search engine that you had to say, I search for something in that Google. And now we just made it a verb, Google it, even if you mean by using something. So of course, language changes as technology develops and languages are globalized, especially English. But the church is going to grow up with whatever translation of God's word that they know or have. And if they only have one translation, they're going to use that unless they reject it. Some churches and Christian communities reject the translation. Sometimes this it doesn't even have to do with the translation itself. It has to do with the translators. If the Christian community finds out that one of the translators professes to be a believer, but is going around living an immoral life, that Christian community sometimes rejects the translation. Why would I read a holy book that was translated by an unholy person? And they just outright reject the translation. So my point is to say there's so many factors involved in a community accepting a translation and then using a translation, whether that use is for their own encouragement and strengthening in the faith, or whether that use is for evangelistic purposes and telling non-Christians about the message that's in the scriptures that that are translated. But these texts, these translations are going to be used by a Christian community in so many different ways. Scripture commands that we meditate on scripture. That we met, which requires memorization. Scripture commands that we sing scripture. So many people who do not know how to read or prefer not to read or cannot afford a copy of a written, printed translation or a digital one. Um, before there's literacy, there is the oral oral engagement with the translation. So people who gather in a Christian worship service are going to hear God's word read out loud and then preached or explained and then sung. The book of Psalms hopefully will be even sung. And then translated portions of scripture will inform the very prayers that are prayed aloud in the worship gathering. So scripture is heard as much as it is, if not more, usually in the history of humanity heard more than it is seen with the eyes through reading and literacy. Yeah, we need stable texts 
So we need translations to last and be accepted by the communities using them for 20, 30, 40 years. But we do have to think about that time when the translation needs to be revised or uh, a complete new one needs to be done. Um, and I think just you know, one other point that, sorry, did you want to interact with that at all? So it did remind me of a story I read by William Mounts in the process of doing the ESV translation that the academics in the room wanted to change John 3.16 to something to the effect of this is the extent to which, or this is how God showed his love from God for God so loved the world because of so loved meaning yeah. a lot. This is how yes. he loved. And the exactly. pastors in the room said, no, we can't do that. Uh, my congregation won't accept that. They're too used to this, even though I do think there's a misunderstanding there. Like we don't talk that way anymore. Yeah. So we don't mean it that way, but that wouldn't matter to people. They want to hear the thing they're familiar with, regardless of what the experts have to say on the topic. I think that kind of goes to your point there. Yeah, receptivity and thinking about the audience. And, and that is a point that many translators take into account when they're thinking about the, the translation choices. They have to reckon with, is there another translation already in existence? Or do the people in this community, because they're bilingual, are they aware of this verse or this word or this phrase in another language that's already been translated? And now they have to reckon with that. Or sometimes what happens is the Jesus film comes out before a translation's even printed and put out. And so then the translators have to reckon with how did the Jesus film render this phrase or that word. Or... So those things are important. But sometimes I think translators put too much emphasis or burden on the translation and think that it's has to do everything on its own when we know from scripture and i already mentioned ephesians 4 that god gives to the church teachers so it's not that the translation has to bear all this burden you mentioned the net bible those footnotes are a gold mine for translators and for pastors to dive into <laughs> not incorrectly using some concordance and oh i used a word study and i know the strong's reference so now i know greek and hebrew no those net notes really help people understand the grammar and what the language is doing in the greek and the hebrew so yeah we definitely need pastors thinking more along those lines and we need translators thinking about how pastors and teachers are going to be teaching and preaching the scriptures and not just oh this translation has to be Everything has to come out. Everything cannot come out in the translation, even with all the footnotes in the world. So that is an important aspect. Um, and yeah, the last point I was just going to mention regarding your question from the chapter was about creeds and confessions. It used to be that, for example, I've been reading Denison's four volumes on the Reformed Confessions of the 16th and 17th centuries in English translation. And in those two centuries, you just have dozens and dozens and dozens of confessions and catechisms that these pastors and theologians wrote for the benefit of their churches. And so frequently, they mention the need for Bible translation so that scripture is read in the vernacular language that the people understand. They mention that the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's table and prayers, you know, the officiating of those sacraments, and the public prayers all need to be done in the, lang the vernacular, in the language that the common people understand, not Latin. And a lot of people like to quote Tyndale, oh, I'm going to do a translation that the plowboy can understand. What Tyndale was reacting to was a clergy who no longer even understood Latin, but were using Latin. And so his point was God's people need scripture in the language that they know and understand so that when they show up to corporate worship and scripture is read out loud it's not read out loud in latin but it's read out loud in english and then it's sung and preached and prayed in english and the confessions used to articulate these things about bible translation and public prayer and preaching and the reading of the word and the sacraments being in the vernacular Slowly over time, um, evangelicals and Protestants, for some reason, started writing their own statement of faith. 
And I have yet to see a modern statement of faith that says anything about Scripture needing to be in the local language, public prayer needing to be in the local language, sacraments being done in the local language. And so what I think has happened over time is that these churches who don't have Bible translation and the worship service awareness that it needs to be in the common language, it has been removed from church's awareness and God's people have stopped praying. They've stopped being aware that this is a need. Um, Surveys have been done and 70, 80% of Americans think that the Bible has been translated all over the world. It's not really a need anymore. And I already mentioned that less than 10% of the languages of the world actually have a full translation. And so I just want to wave that banner and say that advocating for the biblical languages and interpreting God's word and all of that leading towards the translation of God's word needs to happen first and foremost, just in local congregations, pastors praying publicly for this churches, lay people praying about God's word needing to be translated. And as people are aware and praying, they might even consider whether God would have them to be participating in that, whether it's financial, whether it's through prayer, whether it's through them going, whether it's through them learning the biblical languages and becoming a translator or a consultant or an exegete. There's just so much need in the world of planting churches, strengthening churches, training pastors, training translators, and translating scripture that I I, I would wouldn't want to leave this podcast without just making that need known and asking people to pray for it. I've used this metaphor before and I don't know how many times. So the listeners might find it annoying, but that's okay. It's my podcast. Um, When I go out to my car and I put my foot on the brake and I hit the little start button there, I expect that the car is going to start and I want to do the minimum amount of maintenance possible to make that happen every time. But in the bigger picture, figuring out what your priorities are, what's important to you, and then making sure that you engage appropriately. I think whether you're talking about politics or you're talking about your faith or you're talking about intellectual endeavors, it doesn't really matter. If you're not willing to engage, it's not going to work. I think that just is the case all over. So it, and it sounds like that's what you're saying here is that you need engagement where people think that something is important. And so don't tell me, don't tell me your values, show me your budget. It's kind of one of those things. Um, where would you send people as far as books or blogs or YouTube or podcasts? And don't worry, you don't have to plug this one. You're already on it. Um, (laughs) <laughs> what do you think people, like, to get a better understanding of what you're talking about, where would you send people? Definitely not to be self-serving, but the answer to that question, at least I have to start with our website, Bible Translation Fellowship, because I've answered mo- mo- those questions there. I've tried to make that a place of recommended reading. So I have books on every recommended books related to missions, but also related to Bible translation and podcasts. Andrew Case has a great podcast called Working for the Word, where he engages on Bible translation issues and interpretation and biblical languages. And he and his wife uh, uh, do that uh, YouTube channel that I mentioned, uh, Alpha with Angela, uh, sorry, Olive with Beth. And then uh, they also helped jumpstart the Alpha with Angela, the Greek channel. But yeah, on the Bible Translation Fellowship website, there's links to podcasts, recommended reading, and all sorts of of things like that. Okay, I'll make sure to get that in the show notes. What do you read? And if you don't have much time to read for fun, what do you do to decompress? So what do you read for fun? Or what do you do to decompress? I do a lot of reading for work. And I guess the one I don't love reading, so I've never liked reading or studying. <laughs> it's just been by God's grace that I've uh, accumulated degrees and persevered in school. But So I don't read anything for, I really don't read anything if it's not related to scripture, theology, church history, exegesis, Bible translation. Um, the one area that I would say would be more fun in that whole area would be bi- church missionary biographies of, of pastors and theologians and missionaries. Uh, I really enjoyed that um, of God's word coming to life in people's lives in different time periods and cultures. And so I love that. And then when I'm not reading, yeah, just I enjoy hiking and being outside with my wife and enjoying creation. 
Okay. Hey, I'm asking you your opinions and what you prefer. So that's the right answer. Um, well, if you don't have anything else for us, I feel like I can call this one good. Thank you so much. It's great to talk about these important issues with you. Thanks for being here, Kyle. Take care. Lord bless. Thank you so much for listening. Next week is the final conversation in the Islam and the Bible series. And that will be with Mark Dury discussing his chapter titled The Influence of Charles Craft on Missions to Muslims. Here's a quick preview of that episode. Enjoy and take care. I mean, that I think that's just complete misrepresentation of what the Greek fathers did. Um, and, you know, the battle with their, the Greek fathers has to be a battle with their, their readings of scripture. So that's where you'd need to engage. But usually the people that throw the creed out, they have no arguments. They have no reasoned analyses of what the Nicene fathers were trying to express. They just sweep it aside as if as if they had the right.